Uh, so I think we have a, a bunch of people on the call now, and uh, I want to introduce Sasha. I I stumbled upon her blog about uh, a week ago, and I can't even remember what I was looking for. But I I actually I I was interviewing Josh Kaufman, who wrote uh, the first twenty hours, and I was looking for a review. Re, I was looking through reviews of the book. And I came across your rev your visual book review, and I was just like, "Wow, this is amazing! This is so cool." Sasha, do you think you can pull that up on your screen? Yep, I can right. totally pull um, that up on my screen. Hang yeah. So uh, Sasha put together this uh, visual book summary, and I just thought it was so cool. Um, I've always liked drawing stuff out, and recently I've been getting more and more into it. And one of the next uh, courses I'm going to be teaching is on the patterns of geniuses and one of the geniuses that I think has done a lot of cool stuff is Da Vinci and uh, yeah. he was part of the Renaissance and one of the cool things that came about during the Renaissance and made it so special was that people started visualizing information they started creating graphs and maps and mind maps and diagrams and uh, structuring stuff out and uh, Bill Gates actually is a uh, a book collector and a document collector and he I think he spent at auction something like 31 million dollars for one of the key pages in Da Vinci's notebooks and Da Vinci had a really I'm getting kind of off track for the in, the uh, introduction but Da Vinci would write backwards in mirror type and uh, some people thought that it was because he wanted to hide his ideas other people thought that like I can't remember if he was a lefty or not, if that's why he did it, but like smearing the, you smear the ink with your hand if you're a lefty. So anyways, uh, so I'm really interested in that stuff, and I, I saw this book summary, and I was like, wow, this is like, first of all, she's got great handwriting. I have really bad handwriting, <laughs> so I can't really share my drawings because the handwriting is so bad. Um, but... I started looking through her blog, and she's she's uh, doing all this different accelerated learning stuff. And I don't know if she, you, she really calls it that, but um, I just started digging through, and I created a profile and blogged about it. And then we said, "Why don't we do an interview?" So, uh, so I was talking to Sasha earlier about how she's like a, a visual genius. I feel like she's a visual uh. genius. And, <laughs> He doesn't like that label, so I thought I was reading through her book, and I thought it would be uh, funny to go through and give you a little listing of all the different things that she's interested in. I'm sure one of these things is going to stick out to every single person um, listening to this. <laughs> so, uh, some of the stuff Sasha's interested in is computer programming, open source projects, wearable computing. Um, computer science education, Emacs, personal information management, quantified self, Web 2.0, virtual assistance and outsourcing, Drupal, public speaking, Generation Y, writing, copywriting, sewing, biking, art, <laughs> piano, theater, chess, photography, event organization, screen printing, calligraphy, typography, System administration, web development, learning Japanese, poi, Diablo, and other street performances, crocheting, <laughs> singing, gymnastics, <laughs> yoga, Krav Maga. I was kind of surprised about that one. Um, trapeze, <laughs> cooking, ballroom <laughs> dancing, tango, renaissance dancing, swing dancing. I, I've recently gotten into dancing, so we'll talk a little about that. Uh, gardening. I also started gardening this year. And yeah. woodworking. I noticed that you had blueberries planted. Um, yeah. We're starting they, to pick up a couple now, so this is excellent. The funny thing about blueberries is uh, they don't I, – I went to the nursery and I said, how many blueberry plants do I need to make one blueberry pie? And the guy was like, <laughs> nobody's ever asked me that question. And uh, so what happens is you, you maybe get like a pint from each plant, but they don't all ripen at the same time. So you actually get like three berries ripen per day, and then you're supposed to pick those and like put them in a thing, and I just ended up not even picking them because it was like, 
I, I, I realized I, was, I wasn't going to get enough berries to even <laughs> really do anything with them besides like maybe put it in a bowl of cereal, and I don't eat cereal, so. Uh, no, 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 what you do is, so we have the blueberries planted in, in our front yard, and what, what yeah. we do is, every time we notice there's a ripe one or a couple, um, my husband and I just pick it and pop it into our mouth, and you know, it's a nice, amazing burst of flavor that you don't get in supermarkets. So. So if you if you take it as a you know reflection on a single blueberry at a time, it mm -hmm. is a, an amazing thing. So do you put you do netting it. on top of your blueberries? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> we learned this last year. Um, we netted it uh, two years ago, and it, and we got blueberries out of it. We didn't net it last year, and the birds got all of them. So now, yeah. even if it makes the front yard less pretty, we have nets. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes, tangents. Um, I see you found my list of uh, gazillion interests. And this was in, uh, what was that? This was in 2009, so I've picked up quite a few since then. <laughs> yeah, what, what would you say are the uh, biggest ones that you picked up? Well, drawing really has emerged as one of those that a lot of people uh, resonate with. Well, resonate being a funny word because it's audio, right? But um, anyway, so people really like the drawing part. Um, biking has turned out to be lots of fun, so I do that a fair bit as well. I might have, I might have mentioned it, I'm not sure. And, and a lot of the, the data visualization as well. Now that I have, you know, I've been collecting a couple of years of data in, in some cases, uh, I actually have stuff to play around with in terms of charts. So mm -hmm. this, this is a constantly evolving list of interests. <laughs> Would you say you're more of an audio learner or a visual learner? No, I'm terrible at audio. I, I used to fall asleep in university lectures to my great embarrassment. Um, yeah. And, and, and I also still do very badly at um, the massively online uh, courses. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm very much skewed towards reading books, you know, tr uh, just learning through lots and lots of technical manuals and all of that stuff. In fact, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm much more comfortable reading than listening to a presentation. I always get uh, um, a little impatient or listening to audiobooks. I get ex exceedingly impatient unless it's a nonfiction book that's very well read. Sorry, yeah, no, sorry a fiction no, I, book that's I, very I, well, well read. I want to um, I want to get into the sketch notes because that's yes. like that's your real signature, and uh, I'm curious how you originally got into it. How did you get into doing sketch notes? And tell us the, the you know quick story of kind of your evolution. Ha, fortunately, you gave me a heads up, and that's that's one of, that's one of the things that you'd likely be interested in. So I have a draft blog post where I put together all the things. This will come out on Friday or thereabouts, and that okay. means I don't have to keep running around for stuff. So uh, the story began in 2007. I actually don't have much of a visual background. I wasn't one of those kids who was always drawing or, or doodling in class, <laughs> to my great regret now, because if I had, then I could draw much better than stick figures. Um, but I, I, I basically, you know, was, I, I worked mostly in text. I was programming. I was reading books. I was drawing thing was something that other people did, despite the art classes that my, my mom signed me up for. And those are fun, but I wasn't really a drawer. And then in 2007, um, we've been we've been talking about getting Nintendo DS for a while. And uh, since Jessie, who's my stepdaughter, uh, she got a DS, uh, and there were a couple of games that had interesting cooperation modes. And I've been reading about how people were using DSs to draw, so I got myself one as well. And I loaded it up right away with this application called Colors DS, which lets you draw using the Nintendo DS's stylus. So it was a lot of fun, and I would draw things like this, just really you know rough sketches. Sometimes with colors, sometimes I'd use it as a way to relax or remember what I was going or what I was doing uh, and since that was fun I started drawing on paper and um, paper is a little bit harder for me to work with because I'm like well I can't really erase or or do interesting things or work with all these colors but it was a, a fascinating those red challenge. ones are starting to look pretty good and what I what I was I, I felt like the big evolution in your drawings or one of the evolutions came when you went from like drawing the body as a line to like drawing it as a square. For some reason that really adds like a lot of realism to it. 
Yeah, well, there are actually a lot of books that will teach you how to draw stick figures, which is amazing because, you know, five-year-olds get a hang of this just fine. Yeah. Um, but you'll, you'll see, I, I tend to flip-flop between uh, stick figure drawing styles. And I actually have, in, in my archives, a blog post where I tried so many different styles of drawing stick figures to see what I, what I ended up liking the most. I can dig that up later. Anyway, so stick figures, right? I still can't draw anything better than stick figures, but it, were, it, was, it was fun to imagine stick figures in different situations. And then I started doing doing presentations with them. Um, huh, this is actually not the right presentation. I have all my pastes incorrect. So uh, let me dig up that actual presentation. It's a Gen Y guide to, for web duo at work. In 2000 and something, um, one of my friends said, hey, you know, we're talking to all these campus students about social business, and they, uh, they have no idea why Web 2.0 would be very interesting at work. So I made this presentation. I figured, you know what, I have the storyboards. What happens if I turn the storyboards into the presentation themselves? So this is this is the result. It's a totally rough, hand-drawn, you know, just basic, basic presentation. Look, stick figure. With no body, and you know, it's basically that, um, and people really, really like this. To my great surprise, it had more than eighty thousand views um, to this date. Which is anyway, so so people really like these presentations. And then I started drawing more presentations, and they wanted to know how I made those, so I made a presentation about making presentations by drawing them. Uh, and again, very very simple drawings. Uh, and then it turns out that you can get away with with sketches and stick figures instead of bullet points, even at a company like IBM. So I started drawing even more presentations. So look, more stick figures. <laughs> uh, and things like that. So stick figures galore. Um, eventually, I ended up making a, you know, I, I joined this uh, breast presentation contest at SlideShare and made this little, you know, uh, <laughs> stick figure introduction to uh, who I was and what my website was about and I did this in a uh, in um, the rhyming okay, well, even, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes tell me what it going. feels like <laughs> to actually get better at drawing like what does it feel like to go from I can't like even my stick figures look bad to um, something that like you feel is halfway decent or people start giving you compliments on it and are there any hacks for like? <laughs> are there any hacks for like getting to that level faster? I could tell you, except I have no idea what it's like to get better at drawing. Because if you look at the drawings that I make now, which is the, the, the uh, thing that you have on the screen, uh, they're basically still stick figures. So yeah. I haven't gotten any better at drawing. I think the main things that are different are is that uh, I know my tools better. So, you know, I've learned how to make grids. I've learned how to work with different kinds of brushes. I know how to work with layers so I can pretend that I can draw. Um, Did you use any I, yeah. tracing? Did you ever trace stuff? Well, I, 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 I checked out a whole bunch of drawing books from the library. So, you know, all those, yeah, how to draw Disney villains or how to draw hands or whatever else. And they're great. But you know what? When I'm when I'm in the middle of trying to write down uh, or, or capture a conversation, I really just have time to draw very simple images. Okay. So the key thing that, that that really helps then is is just developing your visual vocabulary. So you might start off knowing, okay, if I'm if I need to draw a house, I can draw you know a triangle with a square, and every five year old kid can do this. Um, and then you start thinking, well, how do I represent all these other abstract ideas? How yeah. do I represent tools or connecting the dots or, uh, you know, or talking to people or learning? Uh, and, and, and as you build that, that vocabulary, that's really just a matter of practice. Um, hey, could you pull up that book we were talking about by that guy, who, the sketching book? Oh, it's the sketch of head book? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, no, the the book. Remember the book I sent you yesterday. The e one I emailed you. The guy had a bunch of different. Um, I think I sent you the Amazon link to that. Do you remember? Oh, Ed Emberley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ed, I yeah. to draw everything. Uh, Ed Emberley is awesome. He basically says that you can draw a, a pretty darn wide range of things with very, very simple shapes, you know, a curve, a line, a, a dot. And if you have stuff like that, you know, there's this make a world thing, which is totally awesome. You can draw things like dragons and, and steamboats, really just using very, very simple shapes. So here's here's you know here's the cover of that book right, yeah. uh, and it's you know you can draw all of these. This is a rectangle with dots in it and circles, 
And if you can draw that, you can draw everything in this book. He goes through it step by step. Okay, so... Uh, Drawing is simple and not yeah, scary. Yeah, let's get back to your... Uh, can we go back to that post that you're going to do with the evolution of your drawing so we can take it to the next step? Yeah. Um, so anyway, so the evolution really here is, you know what, you don't need to draw anything super fancy. In fact, I probably won't focus on, you know, learning how to draw hands and faces and figures and all that stuff. Um, you, you basically just need to build the confidence that you can do it. Because even from my roughest, roughest drawings, you know, even from that, that, that stick figure of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, the shy connector, for example, this one got yeah. really popular as well. This is like really simple drawing stuff. And yet people like it. They resonate with it. Um, so if you start drawing, don't think that you need to have an art degree or a fine arts background or be able to paint the Mona Lisa because you can't and I can't. Um, just give it a try and, and share. And, and you'll, you'll be surprised what people find awesome. <laughs> One of the uh, comments we have in here is uh, John wants to know if you can talk about your semi-retirement and minimalist living and, and that sort of stuff. And I... But before you answer that, I'm curious, how long does it take to take these visual notes as opposed to normal notes? Because I know a lot of people listening to this are going to probably going to be thinking, well, you know, you're in semi-retirement, you have all the time, so like you can <laughs> afford this luxury of, of doing these fancy drawings, but uh, for us working in the salt mines, we don't have time to, you know... Do drawing. So I'm curious. Could, can you talk about like what the time, like how long it takes, and if you've gotten faster over time, or uh, oh, yeah. how you approach the time element? So sketch noting. So for example, if I'm doing a live presentation, yeah. uh, let me let me take up some examples here. Got crazy sketch notes. If I'm doing a live uh, presentation, I basically do it right as the person is talking, and then okay. I publish it maybe five minutes afterwards. So, for example, C.C. Chapman gave this uh, uh, interesting talk at um, uh, Third Tuesday, Toronto. He, he talked for about an R, which uh, an R usually translates to one page. Um, okay. And by, by the end of the R, I had most of this done. I filled in a couple of colors while I was waiting for him to autograph it. Huge line, right? So, you know, colored it a little bit. Felt like a six-year-old, uh, but this is good. But basically, it doesn't take any much longer to do this. You just start drawing. You don't have to draw everything. Just like when you're taking notes, you don't have to write down every word, although I try to. Um, uh, and, and you cover whatever you can cover. So this, I did it. I posted it right away, and then I updated when he signed it. Um, this other thing, uh, like the book reviews. Okay, the book reviews... I, I tend to read a business book in about two hours, and it takes me okay. around, you know, basically while I'm reading it, I'm taking notes. And then as I, you know, as I come across more information, I might move things around a little, but it, it really doesn't take that much longer. And it's fun. So one of the issues is, like, if you don't know how much information is going to be crammed into that hour, how do you know how dense your drawings should be or what to include and what not to include. So there's a couple of interesting things here. If you're doing it for a, for a presentation or other live event, yeah. then what I find helpful is I draw with a very, very light grid in the background. And I work on my computer, so it's easy for me to just hide the, the, the grid when I'm saving it in and publishing it. Yeah, and um, can you talk about, just uh, brief, briefly, yeah. can you talk about what computer you use and what application you're using to do the, these drawings? Oh, sure. I use Autodesk Sketchbook Pro. And actually, sh I can show you that. So this is the grid. This is the, sorry, this is the, the um, set of notes that I put together for, for our chat today. Yeah. And I have a pen, which you can't see. I can draw directly on the thing. Uh, so, for example, I can say, uh, hi. See? Ta-da! So I'm doing this on a Lenovo X220 tablet PC, of which I don't have a picture at the moment, but um, but I can show you a couple of other things that I've put together on that. So, uh, so it's basically a, a Windows computer that can convert into a tablet if I spin around the screen, and I draw directly in the screen, which is great because I don't have the it, coordination to do this otherwise. So it edits natively as a PS a Photoshop file? Yep. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Narrative. So uh, you, as you can see, I have layers. If I want to move things around or if I want to erase things, I can just go back in there and hit erase. If I find that you know you talk a lot or what or I talk a lot or whatever, uh, yeah. then I might take the lasso tool and um, and just move things around to make more space. Wow. So that's how it works. And so is this, and, and then you can import this into Photoshop and make any sort of changes in there also, right? I hardly, I hardly ever need to. I usually just make the changes right here. Let's say, for example, if I want to highlight something uh, that, for example, like you don't have to be an artist. I can take that and I can just change it right here. Let's make that brush size bigger. Change that right here. Do you keep, uh, one thing I really like doing is printing out um, stuff, and you like to do that too, but printing out uh, visuals like this, how do you, do you just have a bi three ring binder where you keep all your sketch notes and all the, um, all the different stuff that you find on, what's that website you were talking about that has all the good sketch notes on it? Uh, Sketchnote Army? Yeah, Sketchnote Army. So do you print so those cool. out, like how do you, or do you just put them in, throw them in Evernote and then Flip well, I, I do have a collection that I've printed out that I mainly take it along just so I can flip through it random, but Evernote is super awesome, and I have a blog post about this, also a recorded presentation, because Evernote lets me search inside my sketch notes, which is so, so cool. So, for example, if I'm looking for science, uh, science, 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 you know, it, it doesn't get everything perfectly, but when it does, uh, it can find things. So, for example, uh, da -da 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 -da. This one, right? It can find my handwritten text, science, and uh, or whatever, um, and highlight that. So I really like the fact that these digital tools let me organize my sketch notes that way. And then because I publish a lot of my sketch notes as blog posts, that's another way for me to find things. I do print them out because it's it's fun to see. You know, it's 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 um it's interesting to look at. But the digital archive is just so much more searchable. So when you're, it seems to me that part of what makes you, helps you get better and better is seeing a lot of other artists work and kind of, like one, one pattern I noticed is that at a certain, like in the note that you did for our conversation, you put the heading in black and then you put other ideas in, in like a lighter gray. And so that helps with, kind of your I, your brain can process what's more important information, what's not as important. Yep. Um, do, you have any, you, yes. do you have any favorite uh, sketch note artists? Ah, so uh, like so a, a great resource if you want to be inspired by other people's styles, as long as you don't get intimidated by them, is sketchnotearmy.com. You'll find, you know, a, a, a people's first sketch notes or, you know, some really amazing ones as well. And then in addition to browsing through this on a regular uh, basis, I also keep an inspiration file. So this is where I stick, you know, people's awesome sketch notes or uh, other interesting things like Itagami from, uh, from, the Jap uh, the, from the Japan Foundation or comics that I really like or, or other things that are, are very expressive. Um, so certainly whether you're learning about this or you're learning about any other topic, it's great to go out there and look for role models because then you can say, what is it about this thing? What is it about the way they do it um, that appeals to me? And, and how can I play around with that? So, sketch note so, well, another uh, another thing is, let's say people are used to taking their handwritten notes. What kind of sketches could they make, kind of in the margins of their the notes, handwritten notes that they already do? What kind of sketches could they put together that would be the most impactful? Like what I what I like to do is create like mini mind maps, where if there's like a main idea and three sub points, I'll draw out a little like mind map just to get that idea kind of solidified. So are there things like that that you can do if you don't want to immediately jump into like a full sketch note type thing? Absolutely. Um, so 
<laughs> uh, so, so the sketch note handbook by Mike Rohde is an excellent thing to check out. Uh, okay. It talks about, well, you know, you start off with, with maybe, you know, you play around a little bit of typography or lettering. Uh, you make some things bolder, you make some, you know, or you draw boxes around stuff. So you have containers here, right? Or you add arrows and dividers, and that already helps you start structuring it. Then, you know, you can play around with, with adding a couple of icons, you know, or, or different kinds of bullets. So instead of using a, you know, just a dot for a bullet, maybe you'll use a check mark to, to show that it's something that you need to do. These are all different ways that you can start off with basic handwritten notes and then start making it a little bit more visual, a little bit more engaging. And another thing that I think is really important is when you're working on your business or you're working on a project, actually mapping it out in a visual format. Oh, Can absolutely. You talk about how useful that is and the different, I mean, you're into outsourcing, so I'm sure you use these uh, these visuals to show your the different freelancers you have working for you. So can you talk about how they improve, make life easier, improve your understanding, improve your thinking, improve your communication, and um, making, because one of the things about outsourcing is just, helping the other person understand what you want them to do, and that can be a big friction point. Mm -hmm. Well, I really like the Lean Canvas idea of having everything put together in one page, right? So okay. uh, so brainstorm the whole bunch of different uh, link canvases for the different kinds of business ideas that I might want to explore. Here's one for digital conference or events, event sketch notes, where you have, you know, the problem, the solution, your unique value proposition, all those good things that you want to keep in mind um, right there. And you, as you can see, it's a, it's a very simple combination of mostly text, but a couple of, of icons or, or emoticons or, or other um, uh, images just to make it more fun for me. So I, I, I have things like this and I share them. I share my process as well. I really like writing down step-by-step -step instructions for how I do things. It helps me remember things and it helps other people learn how I do things as well. Um, and that's, that's worked out really well so far. I've, I've been experimenting with delegation for a while and I, I really, really like the way that it helps me get rid of things that I used to worry about or stress out about, like scheduling. Um, and it also helps me, you know, work with people's amazing talents and skills. So, mm -hmm. big fan of it. Definitely give it a try. What, if somebody wants to, for example, have somebody help them with scheduling, um, how could they easily get into that and how much would it cost them? Oh, hey, uh, I actually have a blog post about this. Hang on a second. Let me bring up my... Uh, uh, so I have a virtual assistant. Um, I have several, actually, but the, the person who handles the, the scheduling, like, for example, when we set up this call today, uh, she is based in the Philippines, works for something like five bucks an hour, um, and it usually takes her, yeah, she works on an as-needed basis, so whenever I send her mail, uh, stuff happens, which is great. Um, and the way that it works is, I basically, I gave her access to my calendar, uh, I set her up with email, and it costs me maybe two bucks a week to get my things scheduled, wow. and I don't have to worry about the back and forth, and and I don't have to worry about accidentally double booking myself or messing around with time zones or uh, or things like um, like making sure that people have backup phone numbers, which is awesome, uh, because sometimes if I'm running late or something comes up, I have to be able to call people. So, um, so it's actually not that scary and not that expensive, um, and I, I've, I've included my, so um, actually, let's pick the online meeting ones as, in, as an example. I've included my process for scheduling. Yeah. Plus, I think one of my blog posts has, um, even has the job posts that I've used to, to hire people. So it's, it's, again, it's a very, very easy thing to get into and try out. Now, one of the really interesting things about you is how prolific you are in blogging every single day and sharing so much of uh, what you're learning. And I think it's such a valuable exercise because I think if you don't express an idea that you learn and you just kind of consume it, it, is, it, it doesn't stick long term and it doesn't get used. And you have a... I'm curious if you could talk about what motivates you to do that and and also the benefits that come out of it because you've you've got some really great commenters on your blog and I can tell that 
uh, you're just learning a lot and connecting a lot with other people through that process and I hope that can inspire some of the people listening to start blogging and also um, understand that just by reading other people's blogs, commenting and having your own blog and sharing on it, you can learn a lot from other people by connecting with other people and also the process of getting those ideas down on paper or into a blog post. Mm -hmm. So blogging turned out to be an amazing thing. I started blogging in 2001. Basically, be I, was, I was taking notes on my computer uh, and I was working with this software program um, plan and mode for Emacs and I wanted to build blogging capabilities into it so I, I was using to take notes from class uh, from the things that I was learning and I realized that this is a great way to remember things because other if I if I if I wasn't trying to explain it to myself or to other people it would just disappear I have a hard time remembering what I did last week much less what I learned a month ago uh, so having that kind of record really helped now yeah I started uh, really posting a lot. Uh, I, I wrote about the things that I was trying to teach when I was teaching computer science. I wrote about, um, you know, getting ready for an internship in Japan. I, I wrote about my master's degree. Um, a true story, I had, a, I had such a hard time writing my thesis, so what I did was I drafted put parts of it on my blog, and then I translated it from, you know, friendly blog writing English to uh, ac academic ease. So, so that really helped. Um, and it's you know, it's it's just been a fantastic way for me to remember and to share and to uh, and also even even at the beginning to think things through and to understand. Can you tell us a story about like somebody that you met through blogging? Oh, it's really hard. There's a lot of stories. It's, it's I at this point I have people who have been commenting on my blog for for um for years and years and years, and it's mm -hmm. fantastic because I would be much too shy to email people in the first place. You know, people yeah. always say, you know, the money's in the mailing list, but I'm like, oh, I don't. Do I really want to take up one line in people's inboxes? The blog is great because people can voluntarily read it. Um, they read it when they want to. They they choose whether or not to follow, um, and how frequently they want to hear from me, and and so when I when I write about stuff, you know, and people respond. Maybe they, maybe they give me advice and start a business or they or they cheer me on as I'm learning how to draw or, or trying out all these different things uh, it's you, you get to learn from from so many more people out there and you get to do that without feeling like you're imposing on them or you're you know it, or, or you're in their face or whatever else mm -hmm. so if, if you're shy about blogging and all that I find it really helps to remember that you don't have to be an expert, that uh, yes, other people know more than you and this is a good thing uh, and it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to, you know, write about the things that you're learning knowing that you could be wrong because because you learn so much in the process. Now, one of the things that you talked about in one of your blog posts but I wanted to learn more is you use your blog to actually do spaced repetitions on the different things that you've learned on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. So could you talk about how you, I mean, first of all, do you do that using the, the printouts that you do of your blog, or do you do it looking at the computer screen? And then what does your schedule look like for reviewing things, and uh, how do you keep it all organized when you have so much stuff? So I weekly review from David Allen's Getting Things Done, which is an excellent book and which probably everyone has read at this point. Anyway, so Getting Things Done talks about every week you think about what you've what you've accomplished or what you've done and, and you check that you know you check on things that it might have fallen through the cracks and you plan ahead. So you get a sense of what the key priorities are. And I've been doing these weekly reviews for years and years now at this point as well. So uh, the the way that the weekly reviews have evolved for me is I use it to, you know, just very quickly list down the, the blog posts that I uh, that I posted during the week. So, I, you know, get the titles in there, help me remember. Um, and then I, I, I also have it automatically look at my time, um, the how I spent my time and, and the things that I checked off my task list. Which is actually super awesome when you you know when you tie those things together. Uh, so so I do this every week. I do this pr pretty much every every Saturday now. Uh, and it's it's great for for me to to just remember what I did. Every month or so, 
um, I, I also roll that up into a larger, hey, you know, what did I learn this month? What did I do this month? And what are some things that I want to see in the next month? So, for example, in June here, I said, oh, you know, it's, I've been experimenting with virtual meetups. This was how I used my time. And these were all the blog posts that I had, and I categorized it into, well, different categories. So then I can see where I've been spending more time writing um, and, and also think about, oh, what do I want to, to learn about next? And I roll this up into, you know, yearly reviews. If you if you work at a company that does annual performance reviews, having notes like this is excellent because then you can say, oh, I did all of this wonderful, cool stuff. Um, and even for yourself, personally, it's nice to know where you, that time went, what you did with your life. So this is all goodness. Uh, and then in addition to, to doing this, since I already categorized a blog post like this, uh, I've also been working on keeping a, a categorical index of my blog just because there's so many posts now. Uh, this one just covers posts since 2007. And as you can see, there are a lot of different categories <laughs> that just have, you know, all these different posts underneath them. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so you, you've got that, but how do you actually do the spaced repetitions? I actually don't worry about it too much. Basically, if if um if something is useful for me to remember, probably I'll end up searching my blog for it again at some point. In which case, I go and try to make it more findable. If it was if it took long of time to find it, uh, okay. I rely on people commenting on really old posts to help me remember what I've completely forgotten writing about. This is great because oh, there was there was one post there that had the kids some like year like maybe more than eight years between the time it was posted and the time somebody commented on it uh, but it's it's amazing what people come across in search engines right and then in in um, in WordPress uh, I also have things like you know related posts oh sometimes this this not just me to check things out or things like on this day and then I can I can go back and I can look at well oh yeah this these are the kinds of things that I was working on and I got inspiration from this from you know those 10 years gardening journals or 10-year yeah, journals where you're just making one entry uh, but all the entries for that day uh, throughout the 10 years are on the same page so wow. you get that sense of oh yeah actually we've, we've come a long way <laughs> so one of the questions we got earlier and we didn't finish uh, talking about is your semi-retirement and you worked ah, yeah. at IBM and then you went off and uh, I I don't fully understand what happened, but I'm really curious to hear your story about that. Okay, so and there's there's quite a story about it. Um, I've been so basically I've been saving up in an opportunity fund ever since I started working because I you know it's it's always nice to be able to say oh this there's an interesting idea here or or I want to try this gadget out or I want to play around with this so so opportunity funds great idea if um, set aside some money so you can guiltlessly learn about stuff. Uh, and then I was looking at the the kind of how much of do you how wanted. do you decide how much money to put into that fund? Uh, I, I, you know, it's it, it really depends on on what you can you can set aside. I, I started off with the initial personal finance recommendations of oh we should be saving you know ten to twenty percent for the long term, and I figured yeah another ten percent for for this opportunity fund. So it was just regularly coming out of my savings. Uh, and then when I looked back, it turned out that I actually saved in the the order of like sixty to seventy percent of my income throughout the time that I was working. So it's like oh uh, hey there's you know there's a fair bit of of uh, of uh, of resources here that I can use to do stuff. Yeah. So that was part of it, having the having the resources to do that. Uh, the second part of it was taking a look at how I spent my time and what I wanted to learn. I made a list of the different things that I wanted to to dig into, and I realized that if I saved it for uh, just for um, what you call for for evenings and weekends, I could learn some things. But you know what? I you know there's it'll take longer to get to to everything that I wanted. Uh, and I realized also that because both my husband and I are very frugal, and you know we've and, and I've got this opportunity fund set aside, and I could you know the, it, keep tinkering around with 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 my wants and desires. It turned out, for example, that I don't actually need to go to the movie theater that often, and I I, I don't buy a lot of things. So I decided, um, you know, to be really cool for for learning things that maybe other people don't have the chance to, is what if I if I take you know the Sagmeister idea of having a sabbatical. He takes a sabbatical every seven years, one year off, seven years on, or so, six or seven years of working and another year off, uh, and he finds it to be very creatively recharging. 
Um, but what if I take that and I take the idea of, you know, um, I think Tim Ferriss or somebody else said, you know, moving some of your retirement earlier. And I said, okay, if I if I block off enough time, um, say five years. Five years apparently is, is uh, how long most businesses uh, get, um need to get established or a, a large majority of businesses fail within the first five years. So if you can make it past that point, you're, you're doing pretty well. Uh, if I can save up enough money to not worry about my income or expenses for, for five years, imagine what kinds of questions I can explore. Imagine what kinds of things I can learn uh, because, because the risk is not there, right? You can deal with the risk early. Uh, and so I saved up. And when I reached the, the, you know, when I reached a nice point, and I was reasonably confident that I wasn't going to, to waste all that time just goofing around, uh, I was struck off on my own, um, wrapped up my projects nicely because it's always nice to turn over things well at, at, um, and not burn any bridges. But then I was like, all right, let's let's go on with my experiment. Uh, let's try it out especially since most people don't have the time or space or perhaps discipline or inclination to do this kind of, you know, what can you do if you don't have to worry about income for five years? I wanted to find out. So here I am. So, okay. So let me get this. So you, uh, first of all, it seems like you have, you have to have a lot of confidence to say, oh, well, I'm just going to take all this time off and then I, I'm going to be able to get a job when I, uh, when I need money again. So was, <laughs> was your plan that you were going to figure out a way to start a business so that you would be able to eventually stay in retirement or I mean what was your thinking there cuz that's I don't get the whole transition um, <laughs> I, that's really scary for people. They're thinking Oh well, yeah, I totally. Just quit my job and you know. It was very scary for me too. Um, I so basically, the, the the structure of the five year experiment is, I am going to be completely unhireable for five years, um, and 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 so at the, or if something happens, I can always change my mind. But most, you know, if if things go well, I'll be completely unhireable for five years, and then after five years, I'm going to evaluate whether I want to return to a corporate job, which I actually really enjoyed. I had a lot of fun at IBM doing web development and technology evangelism, or if I decide to do other things. So um, so. So what I, one of the things that I did to, to help, you know, to get into this was imagine all these different ways that it could fail. For example, if it turns out that, you know, at the end of five years, I have, I don't have marketable skills and I don't have a strong network, then I would, I'll have a hard time getting back into the groove of things. That's something I have to watch out for. But I can mitigate all those risks. I mean, I can, for example, um, if, you know, if it turns out that the, at the end of five years, this really isn't my kind of thing and I want to go back to work, I feel reasonably confident that because I can learn quickly and I'm keeping my technical skills sharp or whatever else. But um, most people would yeah. say five years is like a really long time. Like, why wouldn't, why didn't you pick like one year or six months or something like that? Um, mainly because I could, <laughs> and also because you you also don't want to run back into safety too quickly. It, okay. I, 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 um, Where did you, you know, get the inspiration for this idea? Because it's, I mean, this is very radical. Uh, here and there, as, as I mentioned, Sagmeister's sabbaticals, this idea of shifting some of your, you know, retirement earlier, um, and, and, you know, you come across things like Early Retirement Extreme or uh, Mr. Money Mustache, which talk, which talk about, hey, you know, if you radically ex reduce your expenses or you keep a very simple lifestyle uh, and then you save the rest, right? Let's say, for example, if you can save 75% of your income, then every year that you work, you you free yourself up for three more years. So you know all these little things. It sounds kind of like Thoreau's. Uh, do you know Thoreau's quote on that? He's probably said many many good things about being independent. Yeah. <laughs> so worth an experiment, right? Worth trying out. Worth seeing what can happen. Uh, and sure, it's a risk. You know, worst case scenario, I come out of this, I don't have a good story. But you know what? The human brain is amazing at rationalization and pattern making. So chances are, at the end of the five years, I'll be able to come up with a coherent story for how everything fits together and then either convince people to let me stay in business or convince people to give me a job or whatever, right? Or it might turn out that 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 I might even be, like, actually retired, retired. So who knows how it will all work out. So... One of the um, one of the things I wanted to do is go through some of your hobbies, like cooking and gardening, and and ask you 
for example, how is learning like cooking? Or how is your process for learning like cooking? Or mm. sketch noting. How is putting together a sketch note like cooking? The funny thing is, is that all these different hobbies have very similar skills, uh, and 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 so they they really build on each other. Uh, let me let me bring up a diagram that I made of this some time ago. Uh, you, you find yourself doing. Let's say, for example, okay. Uh, oh, somebody asked in the questions what uh, game you were using on the Nintendo DS to do the drawings. Oh, it's called Colors DS. You can install it in a homebrew chip like the R4DS, uh, and it's free. So it's, it wasn't a game at all. It's just some app that somebody had, had put together and shared. Um, oh, yes, so hobbies, right. For example, uh, writing and programming and presenting and presenting as a hobby, um, and experimenting, they all feed into each other. So, so for, and the same goes with a lot of my other things, like uh, quantified self or tracking um, and, and uh, measuring my life so I can make better decisions. That's kind of related to writing. Um, and then I use sketch notes to make it, you know, easier for me to understand things and for other people to understand what I'm, what I'm learning about life based on this data. So it kind of all blends together. Uh, which also means that it's very easy for me to add new interests because the new interests are, you know, are, have a lot of things in common with what I'm already doing. And what would you say are some of those similarities that are the most powerful? Uh, uh, it, it goes back to this idea of, uh, of to the three-word philosophy that I, 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 I figured out for myself, which is learning and sharing and scaling. Uh, with all these different interests, I'm really interested in learning as much as I can and then sharing it with other people because A, I can save them time and B, I learn so much in the process. And then the scale comes from either learning how to do things more efficiently, like with cooking and bulk cooking and, and you know, filling up our freezer with all these different things that we can, we can just pull out whenever we need to go to work and have lunch. Uh, so there's that, right? So there's scaling up in terms of economy economies of scale, and there's also scaling up in terms of how can I share things so that other people can learn from this without my necessarily having to teach them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so there's, you know, I, I find this this learn-share-scale thing, or or even things like the uh, the lean startup idea of a build, measure, you know, you know the, the learn sort of thing. Um, yeah. uh, that reoccurs in all of these different interests and the better that I get at that and the better I, I get that I get at, at core skills like making decisions or or understanding things or learning um, the better everything gets so like when you say getting better at understanding things how do you what does that mean is that like well drawing stuff out helps me understand it better or is it something deeper than that well, uh, funny you should ask, because I actually have a skill breakdown here. I was, I was thinking about what, what learning means, um, and let me break it out of my uh, so skill, 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 learning. Okay. And this is Emacs that's showing up on the, the screen, yes. black code. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The general skills that I've been working on in terms of learning are even identifying what it is that you want to learn in the first place, and then breaking it down so that you can you can learn about it in manageable chunks, and prioritizing it so you pick something that you know engages you or gives you a lot of value right away, or uh, other people really like as well. Getting ready to learn, uh, actually doing the learning, remembering what you learn because this is completely different from learning. You can learn things and you forget them. That doesn't really help. Um, mm -hmm. Applying that in both similar and very different contexts and then sharing it. So all these different things that are packed up into learning that are so much fun to explore. <laughs> what do you what are you, some of your hacks for uh, figuring out what are the best resources to learn from? Because I think that if you just have the best resources to learn from, that can replace so much stuff like speed reading or trying to get stuff from a lot of different sources. If you can find a few things that are just gold mines of information, that can it, it can speed things up so much. 
possibly. Um, I, I, I do have the unfair advantage of actually being able to speed read. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just check out 15 different books from the library in the same topic and then read through practically all of them to see which ones I like the most. I can do that because I can, I, can, I can burn through the books very quickly. Yeah. Um, but it all comes down to what you, you know, uh, understanding how, well, how you learn and how you can learn well. Uh, so for example, if I, if I want to learn more about a topic, I might, I might dig through the books. Uh, I'll look at the you know what the what the library has in its collections. I might look at the Amazon uh, ratings for different books to see what people really liked. I might uh, you know click around to see what blog posts and 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 what resources people referred to uh, are out there. Um, and and also what's what's really interesting there also is figuring out how you can learn from experience. So how can you set up small experiments to learn from so that you're not just learning from other people's experiences and insights, you're also testing to see whether they make sense to you. Okay, so different strategies. Can, you, can you give us a, an example of that? <laughs> like this huge, huge, huge experiment of uh, taking five years off work, work uh, to uh, to play around with with uh, with, with how, you, how how wonderful it can be, right? Um, you you read about it in other people's stories, as, you know. Oh, what uh, what what would they do if they had this financial freedom or independence or whatever? Or it's, or you look at how people are learning from startups, but there's also actually going and doing things, uh, and then things like things like drawing, for example. I could read all the books that I want on how to draw faces or, or figures, but I'm, I'm starting to find things that I want to learn that I can't find books about, which is tremendously frustrating because I'd rather, you know, do the shortcut and learn from what, other what? people's mistakes. <laughs> like, like, how do you express all these abstract concepts that I come across in terms of technology or business or, or whatever? Uh, we don't really have a visual thesaurus that's geared towards this. I think someone's actually working on that in Germany, but anyway, I don't have a visual thesaurus, so I have to build my own. Uh, and, and so what I do is I look at a combination of, of breaking down how other people are drawing things as well as coming up with my own images and, and examples for this and I stick all of that into Evernote just so it's easy to search. So, but, what, you know, there's, there's so what does much. that mean, a visual thesaurus? Uh, okay, so for example, if I want to learn, if I want to draw, uh, what's a the danger? Uh, you know, what are some different ways that you can draw danger? You can draw dangerous an alarm. You can draw dangerous, you know, this stress sort of thing. You can draw it as radiation. Uh, I've got this, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I, I, and then this is one of my experiments where I sat, I sat down and I thought about this, these different ways that you can express danger. Uh, and it's, you know, it's again, it's a combination of learning from what's already out there and then playing around with the concept to see what you can learn on your own too. It you know reminds me of these uh, icon sets that you can get for your website. Mm -hmm. So you must study those a lot. Every so often, so iStock Photo and other stock photography websites are actually pretty interesting sources for you know just how how would people express this or or what you know what are some some visual metaphors or uh, or and 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 what do all these different emotions look like? Um, but but you also find that a lot of people you know the, the they stick to the same basic ways of explaining things, which is actually a good thing because if it's something that's common, then other people will understand it quickly. I mean, some of these things, maybe people don't really understand why it's dangerous. Like this, this one over here doesn't really look like someone getting electrocuted. <laughs> but yes, there's so much inspiration out there. And one of the other things that I think is so powerful with visuals is that in communicating, you've your communication is going to be most clear and most powerful if you can communicate an image that or something that evokes an image in the other person's head and I think mm -hmm. the the metaphors, the visual metaphors also make you a more creative person and when you translate that into business that means that you're going to be more innovative, you're going to be able to stay ahead of your competition and I'm wondering if you've noticed if there's certain things as you got better with drawing or with um, some of your other creative pursuits, uh, dancing is another example, how did that, if at all, did it affect your feeling of how creative you are or how you, things that you've done to become more creative? <laughs> it is, this is kind of uh, an odd thing because I, I'm not really sh sure 
um, I've I've always had fun making things. Uh, programming is an example. I've been programming since I think I was six or something of the sort, uh, and and that to me is is just as creative and just as fascinating as drawing. Although drawing is much easier for other people to look at and go, ooh, that's cool. Uh, so so certainly you know, creativity is something that has many forms, and I think people who tell themselves that they're not very creative do themselves such a great disservice. I've stopped worrying about whether I'm creative or not or whether these things help me increase my creativity or whatever. I just have fun with it and I just keep asking, oh, what would make this better? What would make this more wonderful? Drawing helps, sure, because then I can, ex I, I can express things to people who might not have the patience to read a blog post and, uh, and uh, the book reviews and all that stuff help me connect with other people. Um, but there's, you know, there's there's so much in terms of, of things that you do that, that you can look at and you can say this is creative. That you shouldn't limit it to just saying, oh, drawing is creative, I don't draw, therefore I'm not creative. Um, and and then there are always ways that you can keep expanding your brain's ability to think laterally or to, to uh, come up with interesting ideas or to look at existing things in a different way. Well, one example of that I think is um, things like learning how to dance or gardening. You've got to, I mean, for me, learning how to dance, like, I I played sports, but um, dancing is such a different kind of skill than all, different intellectual skills like learning business or learning about different subjects, and uh, it really was humbling, and it really brought me back to square one, and uh, it, I, I, I got frustrated a lot with it, and I felt like I wasn't getting better. And I had this, I noticed this sort of short-term mindset creeping up. And usually I'm not, I try to be a long-term thinker. And one of the things about starting the garden this uh, spring was that with a garden, um, one of the, people are always making jokes in internet marketing about how everybody wants the magic pill instant solution. But with a garden, there's no instant garden. You've got to like put the seed in, and you got to water it every day, and you can't forget to water it. And it's almost like having children, having plants, because they depend on you. And so it, it kind of forces you to take that long-term view. And I think just the that distinction between short-term view and long-term view ends up being really important in learning, because if you're just focused on the short-term techniques and and uh, tricks and tips, you never get into the systems thinking. And that's something that you're, I think you're, that's one of your strengths, your key strengths. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, the thing that I like about gardening is that you do a little bit of stuff, but then things happen in the background without your input. So every time I look at the garden, I'm like, oh, look, there are new plants in there, uh, which is fantastic. So it's it's kind of different. I, you, you plan your garden more, uh, I guess. Um, is it true I, I, that yeah. plants grow at night and not during the day. I have no idea. I, Stuff just I happens. I heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> so and then in terms of you know, in terms of well dancing, I, what I liked about dancing was the same thing that I liked about presenting and interviewing and all of that. It's that it's that give and take and something fascinating happens, mm -hmm. right? When it, when you're giving a presentation and you're dancing, you're listening with your entire body to the other person and, and stuff happens, or to the audience, and, and stuff comes out of it that you couldn't do in your own. So there are all these different things that, you know, the these different experiences that these interests open you to, and um, and for me, I guess you know, because the human brain is really good at drawing connections between stuff. You know, being able to take a step back and say, oh yeah, th my interest in this led to my interest in that, and this is the system, and this is how it all fits together. That's actually something your brain is really good at rationalization. So systems, you know, take a step back and, 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 and take that long-term perspective. And I find that even if I'm just exploring, you know, if I'm following the butterflies of my interest, just going where my energy leads me from moment to moment, um, over the years, it actually works out really well. So I'm surprised that the things that I, I played around with, you know, the Nintendo DS that I played around with in, in 2007 or something like that, turns out to have this kind of ongoing influence in my life. Uh, it's what, yeah, that's one of the things, it, yeah. that's one of the things I noticed about your, uh, I watched your Quantified Self presentation, and uh, 
one of the other things that um, in studying geniuses is that they tend to, Albert Einstein was famous for taking his afternoon naps and I, I remember in your quantified self thing you were like bragging about how much sleep you get and I'm the same way, I need like I need nine or ten hours to really be <laughs> at my best and, and people are always saying oh you sleep too much and stuff but I think that in terms of learning if you're sleep deprived I was sleep deprived probably every single day when I was in school and it, it really uh, hurt me and it wasn't it, it really takes a toll on how much you enjoy your life I think and uh, one of the other things you just mentioned was how you follow the butterflies of your interest and I think a lot of people uh, first of all I love that metaphor but second of all um, when you're following your your curiosity in the moment I think that puts you in a flow state where you're really maximizing your the potential of your brain and a lot of people try to force themselves to learn things and they put deadlines on themselves and stuff like this and I think it ends up stressing them out and they don't enjoy learning and so then they don't they don't enjoy doing things like spaced repetition because they view it as something they have to do as opposed to something they want to do I think enjoyment is such a big part of it, you know, whether it's sleep or having time for discretionary activities or spending time with people or whatever else. I, I, I suspect that one of the reasons why I enjoy learning so much is because I enjoy life in general. And so I'm not pushing myself to, you know, complete this by so-and-so date or, or do this or else, you know, or, or, or else I get fired or else I do this or whatever. Um, so, so certainly having that kind of freedom and, and curiosity will, will make a big difference. And then, you know, and then the other thing that people are worried about is, is whether that, you know, leads to a lack of commitment or whether they're going to be dispersed or distracted, a dilettante of, um, it, with, with, with too many interests and not being able to get really deeply into, into one. But the funny thing is that is that things tend to come together. So, uh, for example, an interest, you know, my interest in drawing turns up in my consulting and I start doing a little bit of that at work too or, or whatever else. It's everything turns out to be useful is if you look for those connections. Yeah, and uh, that's another one of the patterns um, in studying geniuses is that they tend to see the similarities or the resemblances between different things and that's why metaphors are so important because they're um, they're kind of representations of the similarity between two different things. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about to kind of wrap up is what do you think, I think the future of learning is really going to go more into this, this visual format in terms of putting things uh, in mind maps and flow charts and diagrams and drawings because it just it instantly clicks for people and it makes sense and I so I think there's a huge opportunity in there and I'm wondering what your opinion is on um, and even kind of from a business angle as well where do you see the future of the industry in terms of sketch noting but where do you see it expanding and how do you think it's gonna impact the next five or ten years of how people learn and you know, even books and stuff like that, people putting more drawings in books and so. Oh, I'm so excited about that. So it turns out that graphing, graphic recording and graphic facilitation, this drawing of, of what people talk about in meetings and presentations, has been a thing for decades. It's just been a well-kept secret. Uh, and as we get better and better at doing it you and know, sharing it and inspiring other people, and as the tools also themselves progress, and a lot of people are drawing on tablets where where because they can erase things, they feel more confident. I know because I can erase things, I, I feel more confident about drawing when I wouldn't try on paper. Um, so the tools are getting there, the, the ability to just share things online or even search for information within these images and share things that you find fascinating, um, that's that's contributing to it. Uh, uh, publishers are, are getting more used to this idea of, of adding fat, you know, cute little things in the, in, in the books. So it's not just, you know, so for example, Head First has this entire series of technical books that have, have uh, drawings and doodles and diagrams in them. Uh, and you have books coming out as, as comic books or whatever. Back in, back in uh, high school and university, my mom used to get us these, uh, you know, cartoon guide to physics and cartoon guide to history and all of that. But we're seeing that go into more and more um, 
books outside, you know, uh, so books in books in technology. So this is great, excellent trend. I'm definitely looking forward to what people do with it. But the most important thing for me is that people know that they can do this themselves. That yeah. it's not just for somebody else to, you know, to draw things. Oh, that's fantastic, or the books do, you know, to be more interesting because they have pictures in it. But they can use this as a technique to help themselves learn and help and to help people make sense of life. So give it a try, um, and things will just get even better. The last, the last thing I want to mention is we didn't talk too much about connecting, but you have a great presentation called How to Connect as an Introvert. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, the shy connector. <laughs> uh, one of the things I was, uh, a few years ago, I stumbled upon this uh, handwriting analysis thing, and you said that you were, uh, um, you were an introvert, and, and sometimes introverts feel like they have to pretend to be an extrovert in order to you know connect with people and so I, I kind of forgot what the uh, actual patterns of handwriting um, analysis are so I looked it up last night because I um, you have your uh, signature you, you have your signature on every note so I did a little analysis of it and the analysis of it actually says that you're not you're somewhere between an introvert and an extrovert because you've got um, these large <laughs> loops in the letters, and it's and uh, whereas an introvert will write their letters very up and down, somebody who's more extroverted is more expressive, and so they tend to slant their letters to the side. And I noticed that in your signature, so I just want to let you know that you might have an extrovert inside you that's trying to get out and uh, is expressing itself in your handwriting. So, so this is this is a variant of you can't possibly be an introvert because you give lots of presentations, you you have all these like people on LinkedIn or you blog, holy cow, you blog. Um, uh, and and the funny thing is, is that you know basically intense social interaction like conferences or whatever totally wiped me out. I, I will sleep for fourteen hours after a conference, um, yeah. and. You know, it's and it's not just a matter of staying up late because I looked at the time; it wasn't just that. Um, pe some people get a lot of energy out of talking to people. I uh, I, I like recharging, and I, I recharge by being quiet and and reading and and writing and all of that. But the funny thing is, is I've found all these different hacks uh, that that help me connect with people and on on my terms and on their terms. So it's not that I need to pretend to be an extrovert, and I actually don't go to events all that often, and I. Still, I've got a blog post coming up about this. I actually have to geekily figure out how to give parties, um, <laughs> but it's it's true because the party thing still you know worth thinking about. Yeah, I, well, um, I but yeah, it's okay to be an introvert. Is is what I want to say, uh, and it's not that I'm secretly an extrovert. And all that, I, I know that I will get drained by, by intense social interaction. But the funny thing is that there are all these different ways around it. So, for example, sketchnoting or or blogging or or all these other ways for me to connect with people, give them something of value, so I don't feel guilty about taking up their time, and, and learn so much from them as well without necessarily imposing and say, no, you got to teach me, you know, all this stuff. You specifically um, need to tell me. Uh, at this time, it's kind of weird. Um, but if it's a blog comment and I ask questions and people respond, uh, that's fantastic. So it works for me. Um, find, if you're an introvert, find ways to hack around it, and you can find that that it's totally all right to be an introvert. <laughs> well, Sasha, it was great talking to you today. Um, can you give people uh, your website and how they can find out more about you? And uh, we'll also put some links in the comments here. Uh, so you can get to her website and some of the stuff she talked about today. For sure. Since my name is somewhat hard to spell, to get to my website at livinganawesomelife.com. So that's living an awesome life, like it is. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter at Sasha C, which is Shara Alpha Charlie Hotel Alpha Charlie. And you'll probably want to look up the show notes or the YouTube video for that one. S A C H A C. Anyway, so there, living an awesome life. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Let's get the conversation going. Sounds good, Sasha. Great talking to you again. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. <laughs> All right, then. Yep, have a good one. Okay, ending broadcast when I find my mouse. <laughs>